So this is it. This is all we need to hear. And what it is, is a countdown sound. It's a countdown for 46 seconds. If we get all of the lithium batteries in the world, we can deliver 46 seconds of the world's daily power requirements. Just 46 seconds. Yet lithium-ion batteries are our most effective, effective mass market solution available. And as we go to renewable energy sources, we will need more batteries. So batteries, 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 the world just needs more batteries. So I want to talk to you today about battery basics. What, what is a battery? How do we make them better? Um, I come from an uh, academic background originally. I've done a lot of research in the lab, which has been about carbons and how, we make, how they can be used in energy storage. But when I left the UK, I came here probably about six years ago, I've been predominantly in industry. So what I can't tell you is all the research I've been doing in industry because that's secret and I'm scientists uh, sign my life away into silence. But what I can do is give you a flavour of the type of things we've been looking about, uh, looking at and talking about. So even when I talk about markets, when I talk about energy, when I talk about where we're going and what we're using the batteries for, this is what we're talking about every day in the office, in the lab, because this is where we need to find solutions to our energy problems. So I want to, uh, so I've worked in a couple of companies since I've been here, looking at supercapacitors, the lead acid battery, and now I'm in a the startup company called Julion. Um, and I'd like to be able to take you through some of the work or ideas around this field and where we're going and what we need to do to make batteries better. And tomorrow we'll come back and look at how we can put batteries back into practice, where they actually fit in in our daily lives and how we can actually get things, get our energy requirements where we need them at a specific time. So um, it is really great to see you here. I was just talking to one of the girls down the front saying that, you know, it was 10, 15 years ago when I attended my first summer school here. I left, came from New Zealand and went to ANSTO, which is the nuclear reactor facility. And it was just such a wonderful time to be connected with people who think the same, people who have the same sort of passion. And reflecting on that, there was a class of maybe 30 people, but I'm probably still in touch with two of those people. And over the years, we have on and off touch base, but we've always been there to say, hey, have you thought about this? Or here's a job, or here's grants to apply to. So I really think you have such an amazing opportunity here you know, learn all the science, learn all the things, but also really value the connections you have, have been making and are going to make through the rest of your time here because you never know when you need to draw on those. I fundamentally believe that science is not an individual path. You need to build on the work before you and you need to work with your team members because each and every one of you here, if you take on a science career, has the potential to actually influence where we're going and, and actually set the stage for society in the coming years. I mean, you guys are it. It's, we, we're going out, but you guys are coming in. So I think it's absolutely fantastic that you can come here today in this, in the last, and over the last two weeks to, um, to really interact. But, and, and so do value it, because I think it actually will influence your careers. When I had the opportunity, it's influenced mine. So um, it's great to be able to give something back now that I've come down that path. So uh, the global battery market is to become one of the world's largest markets, large, largest ind industries. And that is because we simply need to be able to access power. So here we have a, a graph which shows the, the, uh, the battery market in terms of US dollars in billions. And as you can see, if we look from 1990 to the projected 2020, it is just growing and growing and growing. Now, we can break it down into different applications. So SLI will be start, light, and ignition batteries for your cars, your motorbike, your trucks, that sort of thing. 
So that's your main one that's come through, and you, you're typically looking traditionally at lead acid batteries in that. We also have portable devices, power tools. We no longer have to have your builder connected to every cable in the house when he's, when he's building, building your kitchen, as I know, because this has been happening this week in my house. Um, we also have new things like e-bikes coming on. So that's another segment there that you can see has, has sort of developed around 2005 and is expanding. And then industrial, which will be things like plugging into um, telecommunications towers, supporting uninterruptible power supplies, renewable energy. That's that market expanding. So this graph here represents both primary and secondary batteries, so it's probably a good idea to define that. A primary battery is a battery that you will only use once, and then you chuck it out. The secondary battery is what we're really interested in, and that's one that you recharge and charge over and, uh, and discharge over and over again, and we want to last, make them last as long as possible. Um, so the global secondary market, and we can get stats that all... That all uh, vary a little bit, it depends on your source, is, is uh, forecast to grow over the next decade to around 20.5 billion US dollars. So we're not talking small stuff here. And of course, we, when you see pictures, we automatically know we can visualize where the batteries fit in. So we've got cars, electric vehicles, Tesla is your popular vehicle nowadays with uh, the lithium-ion battery in that, bikes, buses, and even uh, forklifts. And then all the, all the uh, electronic devices that we use every day, tablets, computers, your wearable watches, even payment devices because they're no longer connected in when someone hands it over to you to swipe your card, all these things require batteries. So if we, uh, let's see if I can get the, consumer electronics is your, is your major, major one here if we break it down into what you use it and we can see it is going to grow quite rapidly. And same with transportation, particularly as we now want to move into, into uh, electric vehicles. We expect that market to particularly take off. And then the new one that's coming through is, is batteries to uh, support renewable energy. So that's something that has just come out and that's the Elon Musk story in South Australia. That will be part of that story there. So to, to put the battery in perspective, it's worthwhile having a look at um, how it stores energy. So I've just given you an example of electricity storage by technology. So here we're going to look at physical and chemical principles and group, group storage technologies by that. So typically, you know, mechanical storage is your pumped hydro, your compressed air energy storage, or a flywheel. If we go to thermal, we've got hot water, molten salts, phase change materials that release, release energy when they change structure. Um, electrical storage, supercapacitors. We'll touch on that briefly because supercapacitors do impinge on the battery market. Um, and then, of course, your electrochemical storage is where your batteries sit in. So we have so many different types out there. We can't possibly cover them all today but they've given examples of sodium sulfur batteries, your lithium ion, vanadium redox flow batteries, that's another Australian invention back in the mid-1980s. Uh, um, so they're all types of batteries and they, they classed under electrochemical storage. And, and then we have pure chemical storage, which would be your hydrogen, your hydrogen fuel cells, uh, synthetic natural gas as well. <coughs> So let's go back to the basics. Let's start at the very beginning. What is the concept of storage? So we can imagine a battery like a bucket, and if we are filling up the bucket with water, we can, and, and the tap, we turn on the tap, we can turn it on slowly, uh, and that has a low rate of input, and the bucket empties and fills slowly if you, if you drain it at the other end. So we can either turn the tap on if the, the bucket stays the same, same size, we can turn the tap on really, really high and we get a high flow for a short amount of time until it reaches the top or we can adjust the flow down and we get low flow for a longer time before it reaches capacity. 
Of course, we can change the bucket size. So if we have a large bucket, we've got large storage capacity, longer time to reach capacity, and then it takes longer to empty as well. Now we think of the water in the bucket as your energy that can be stored. So how much water in there is how much energy that is stored. We can change the amount of water in the bucket and that can, can be called your uh, charge rate when you're putting the water in and similarly your discharge rate when you're letting the water out. Now every bucket or every battery has some sort of leakage so we need to account for that because that will be the inefficiency of the battery. They can range from 0.1 to 0.3 percent a day, so your battery may discharge or leak energy at 10 percent over the space of a year or three months, depending on the, on the technology, but there's always that factor in. So if we want to talk about potential, we can think of potential in terms of raising the bucket to a different height. So we can put the bucket on the table and it sits at one, at one metre um, and that has a head of pressure behind it and that's so, that has a potential unit of let's just say one volt. Now if we raise that bucket up 10 metres we change the potential to say 10 volts. A battery is not going to operate at 10 volts with a single cell but you get the idea. So we can think of the head or the pressure as another alternative to potential or voltage. Um, similarly, we can now change the, wa the water tank and this is the tap coming out and we look at the flow as the number of mo water molecules that pass the fixed point and we can change the, so that's the current, and we can change how much comes in or comes out. So if we have a one centimetre pipe for the water to come out, we have low current compared to a 10 centimetre diameter pipe where we have much more current flowing. Now, every battery will have resistance. So the water tank can, can have no resistance, so that's, that's very unlikely. So there's no slow of, slow of water here. But typically you will always have some form of resistance and, and the water has to find a way or the electrons have to find a way to get to, to move around the circuit. So if we combine current and resistance and the ability to do work, the potential of the bucket, we have power. Uh, the, sorry, the water pressure, and give it so the flow times the water pressure is the ability to do work and that's your power of the battery. What we want to be able to do is access power really quickly, so we don't want to sit there and wait for something to, for a charge to trickle in slowly We'd like our iPhones to charge in five minutes instead of one hour, that sort of thing. So that's what you're talking about when you, uh, when you refer to power of a battery. So before we go into batteries, I want to talk about the double layer capacitor because this will feed into something we talk about later. Um, the double layer capacitor can also be called a super capacitor or an ultra capacitor, depending on what word you like to use. So how does it work? Well, if we take two carbon electrodes, so this is, these are your electrodes, in an uncharged solution in your, that contains an electrolyte solution. Then we put a charge on it. Now there is no chemical reaction that takes place. Instead, on the anode we get the negative charge and on the cathode we get a positive charge and the ions in the solution line up uh, so we get the positive aligns on the negative and the negative cat uh, anions align on the positive electrode. And simply by aligning the ions in solution by applying a charge is a mechanism for storing energy. Now this can happen really, really quickly when you put the power, the electricity on or a current. These, the, the molecules or the anions and cations line up really quickly. So it's a, it's a high power device. So it has high efficiency, it has actually very good cycle life because there's not a lot of moving parts or um, chemistry that has to take place. Uh, it's, it's very flexible, scalable, and of course it's high power. The disadvantage of this sort of, of technology is that it's low energy. It's very hard to actually create more energy. You have to build, simply build more electrodes with more, more electrolyte in it. Um, 
It requires power and conditioning to kind of get it working a little bit. So, so you might have to run the cell a few times before it actually works efficiently. And it's expensive per unit of energy of capacity. But that's essentially because it's not built to have energy capacity, it's built for power. So I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that point. It's a way of, but it's, it's, it doesn't have good energy. So then we move on to the electrochemical cell, which is really what typical or main batteries like a lead acid battery is based on. So if we, uh, if we take a look at this diagram, um, here we've got an le electrochemical cell and we, it's in a charge and we want to discharge it. So oxidation occurs at the negative electrode and the anions in your elect electrolyte solution uh, lose, lose electrons and the chemical reaction occurs at the negative elect uh, electrode. On the other side, we've got cations flowing to the positive electrode and reduction occurs. Now, from high school chemistry, my teacher said, Leo says ger, and then he put a lion up on the screen. So it's lose electrons, oxidation, gain electrons, grrr, reduction. And that's the only way I've ever remembered it. So if that helps you, there you go. And then, and then on the other side, when we uh, discharge the cell, the opposite happens. So I'll show you chemical examples of what this means in the next couple of slides. But in, in comparison to the ultra-layer or double-layer capacitor, it has relatively high efficiency. It's extensive experience for portable applications, so this is the sort of chemistry that goes in our cell phones and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's suitable also for medium to scale applications, so we can power South Australia if we really need to. Um, it does have limited life cycle. The, the, the fact that you have a chemi chemical reaction will, will tire out over time. Um, there are a number of environmental and safety hazards associated with different chemistries. Um, and it's got limited flexibility in power and sizing. So we will address, look at some of these things and how we can improve batteries to get them to perform for specific applications. So what makes a battery a battery? What do we really need? Well, we can think of eight critical requirements. So we want high specific energy. So when we talk about specific energy, it's really about energy per unit of mass. So you divide through the number of active grams of material, for example. We want high specific power. We want it to be affordable. It is, I do not think that batteries are affordable today. I really think we need to see a massive change in the market to be able to have batteries in our homes on the scale that we need to support renewable energy. So affordability is actually a huge criteria. We want them to have long life. My cell phone, my iPhone is dying after two years. I, I don't want to replace the battery after two years. I'd like it to go for five years. Um, we want them to be safe. We, you've seen in the news all about lithium-ion fires and, and things like that, so that's sort of a hot topic right now. We want them to operate over a wide range of temperatures. I want to go out and turn on my car in sub-zero temperatures. I also would like my car to work in the Sahara Desert. I'd like my iPhone to work in the lab when it hits 40 degrees and the uh, air conditioning has gone off. Um, and they don't always, so they start to reach limits based on on just the temperature of your environment which, which you're operating in. And because we all, you know, they're, they're mostly made to operate around 25, 20 degrees, we don't often reach these limits, but it is key. Another requirement is the toxicity. Lead, cobalt, lithium, all these things are going to be spent at the end of the battery's life. So what do we do with them? How do we recycle them? Um, it's, it's just one of these issues that we have to face to keep our technology clean. And ultimately, we want it to be fast charging. We don't want to sit around all day for a battery to charge because we just want to get on with life and use, use our technology off the grid. So what does this mean in terms of research, batteries, improvements? Well, this is called a Raguni plot. Basically, you plot power against energy. So, 
supercapacitors, as we've just talked about, they have high power and, and not very high energy. Batteries, on the other hand, have higher energy density, but they don't go quite into the power spectrum that supercapacitors do. But we are pushing the boundaries. The supercapacitors are becoming more powerful. We want, we're pushing the boundaries in the energy direction, so they're becoming more like batteries. Vice versa, batteries, we want to extend their power so they are becoming more like supercapacitors. So when we start to see this merging of the technologies, we see where we want to compete. And often we have to now look at what application best suits our energy or our power, power requirements, and we choose a battery or a supercapacitor based on that. So let's go back to looking at energy storage market and just putting batteries in perspective. So this is from um, Global Energy Storage Market Overview from 2015, so it's not too out of date. Most of the energy storage market is in pumped hydro, 99%. Of that, 1% is left over. Half of that, about half of that, is in compressed air technology and your flywheel, which are... So, so half, again, so we've got 0.5% on battery technologies that, is, that are current in the energy storage market. And then we can break those down into different types of batteries. We have a sodium sulfur battery, your lithium ion, which we all know about, lead acid, nickel cadmium, and the redox flow, which I've already mentioned. And there's others out there too. So in terms of the, the market, we are really only occupying a small space, um, comp particularly compared to hydro, but it is going to grow. And there is so much opportunity out there to be able to take over where other technologies can't. So let's go back and look at the very first battery that became commercial, that was ready for commercial use, and that's our lead acid battery. It was invented back in 1859 by a, uh, a French guy called Gaston Plante. I, and it's one thing about the lead acid battery and why we still have it in, in lots of applications is that it's dependable and it's low cost. So we still have it every day when we get in our car, unless you can afford a Tesla car. We still have it um, supporting power grids, supporting power stations. So this one here is a flooded cell. This is a traditional lead acid battery. It is, uh, you can see the, um, the plates in here, which is the cathodes and the anodes and the electrolytes. They often make it out of clear, clear plastic, so you can see what's going on. Um, so that's your traditional flooded cell. A sealed lead acid battery is what you put in your car. And that's probably what we're all more familiar with when you open the, the hood. Here's another sealed lead acid battery. It's just in a different form factor. You'd probably stack those in uh, power stations or off-grid scenarios. Um, maybe your camper van, to, if, you, if you want to go on the outback, you can pop one of those in your, in your trailer. Um, still the same chemistry, just a different form factor. So how does the lead acid battery work? Well, here we're going to put real chemistry to the, the, uh, the diagrams that we had earlier. So in the charged state, we have a lead oxide, a spongy lead oxide cathode. We have a sulfuric acid electrolyte. And then on the anode, we have just a lead, um, sorry, this one is the lead, spongy lead plate, and this one is the lead oxide. This is orange, this looks black. And when we, uh, when we, when we charge the cell, discharge the cell, the lead, the, lead, uh, the lead plate reacts with the electrolyte and forms lead sulfate plus some hydrogen ions. And, the, and, and at the positive, um, positive plate, we've got the lead oxide. It reacts with the electrolyte, the sulfuric acid, and, um, and we get lead sulfate forming again, plus some water left over. So note, note the water, because that's one of the failure mechanisms of lead acid batteries. So in the discharge state, we've got lead sulfate on both the cathode and the anode, and your sulfuric acid electrolyte solution has been diluted. Then we charge it, and we end up back with lead oxide and lead again. 
<coughs> so what does a lead acid battery look like when we open it up? This is probably the best image I could find to, ha to let you have a look. And we're looking at the, uh, you can't see the, the, um, the lead plates in here, but you can see the, the membrane between the cathode and the anode. And it's all welded together across a buzz bar, and these are connection points which you would lead to, lead to out here, and that's where you'd connect the battery. So it has a typical lead grid. Um, it's, this is, the black one is your lead oxide. Here we've got a membrane. Uh, this, this is the... Uh, uh, you'd have a positive plate, which would typically actually be orange lead... lead uh, the lead, sorry, the lead oxide, the lead is black. And, and these are all stacked together in an array to form your cell. So let's have a look at the grid structure because one thing we want to do is make the battery, battery better and make it operate at, at better capacities and things like that. But there are certain um, failure mechanisms that we can overcome. So one of, the trouble, one of the problems with lead is that it's actually a very soft material to work with. So uh, we can do things like, to strengthen it, we can add things like antinomy, calcium, tin, selenium. However, once you start adding chemistry to the lead, you change other factors. So if we add antimony and tin, we improve the ability for the battery to deep cycle. So that means you take the battery from 100% charge, you could potentially go right down to, say, 80% depth of discharge. A lead-acid battery doesn't like being discharged to 100% of its energy. It fails over time. But if we didn't have that, perhaps we could only take it down to 70% discharge or 60% discharge. But then because we've added these other elements into the lead plate, we've actually, what happens in this case is that we increase water consumption and the need to equalize. So we lose water and the cell dries out and therefore the battery fails. And how we compensate to that is we equalize the cell. Now that means instead of just charging the cell to, to 100%, we would overcharge the cell. So in a single cell for a lead acid battery, you're operating, you probably charge it to 2.13 volts. And to equalize the battery and to reset the chemistry, you'd overcharge it to, say, 2.45 volts. So it's a significant overcharge, but it kind of helps even out the water loss and the acid stratification and things like that that go on. And all lead-acid batteries need that boost every now and then. The other thing we can do is put calcium in. But this, and this will reduce the self-discharge. And this happens on the positive side. Of, of the, of the uh, lead acid grid. One of the things that happens then is that over time as the battery in, uh, ages, the, the lead grid itself grows and expands and it doesn't actually contract down. Now we can um, change how this, this operates and the, and the influence that it has by adding other elements. So um, companies might add selenium, cadmium, tin, to, to lower the relative calcium contents and mitigate that effect, but it's not always, it's not always a workable solution. So if we look at this diagram, what we see is different lead structures. Now, we can strengthen the lead plate by, instead of having uh, parallel lines and perpendicular lines to make a square, we can engineer the, the, uh, the, the lead grid into a different structure to give it more strength to be able to promote conductivity, that sort of thing. Uh, what I have seen in terms of mitigating the effect of the plate growth, uh, if the plate grows, you're going to have it expanding into the size of the case and then the case will crack and then your electrolyte leaks out and you have failure mode and very unhappy customers. So what some uh, manufacturers have done is actually put feet on the bottom of the grid, and as the grid grows, say, in a, in a horizontal direction, the feet slowly collapse. So it's not all about chemical engineering to overcome problems. Sometimes we just think outside the box, and we have, a, in this case, a mechanical solution to, to a failure mode mechanism. 
So one of the things I, I highlighted earlier was that when the cell is charged and discharged, we produce water. And this is called gassing. Um, it happens throughout the battery life, but particularly when you hop, operate at high voltages or you overcharge the cell to rebalance the cell. So the water will break down into its components, which is hydrogen and oxygen. It's then in a gas phase and it disappears out the battery. So in your traditional batteries where they're flooded, so that first example that I showed you where you could see inside the battery, those batteries have to be topped up regularly. So if they're in a, in a power station, you would actually have someone on a schedule coming around and filling them up with, with water on a regular basis. The other way we can avoid this problem is to seal the battery. Um, and, and these are common batteries and what you get in cars now. So the first type of sealed batteries is your valve-regulated lead-acid battery, VRLA. Um, in the seal system, the pressure builds up, but this is not a bad thing because it actually forces the hydrogen and the oxygen to recombine and go back into, form water and go back into the electrolyte and the battery continues to operate. However, we don't want too much pressure building up, so we still we have what we call a valve at the top of the battery, and when the excess pressure builds up, it releases it into the atmosphere. So then the, the, the condition is you have to actually make sure there's not too much hydrogen going into your, perhaps, a closed container because hydrogen is also, also dangerous. So, so there's all these things, levels of things you have to think about when you're designing a battery. Uh, another option is to um, use an absorbent glass mat and the, here the electrolyte is suspended on the glass mat. It means everything is contained within that glass mat and you've got less opportunity for the water to escape. Um, it also has other advantages. That the battery can be charged faster because we can get movement of ions and, and um, electron transfer. And it can better cope with high instant loads simply because we can move that charge through the battery a whole lot quicker. The other advance in recent years, which has actually come out of um, CSIRO again, is the gel battery. And here we convert the liquid electrolyte, so the sulfuric acid, into a gel by mixing it with silica or wacker, and we literally make a thick, sticky paste. Um, the gel is a whole lot better at transferring heat. It again captures the water, so we don't have water loss, but, but it comes at a higher cost. So here again, we're going to say, well, do we need to have a battery that uh, is sealed? And how long will it last? Is the cost worth it? All these things play out into what battery you would purchase for a particular application. Um, another thing that happens over the life of a lead-acid battery is sulfation. So this occurs regularly on charge and discharge, and it's exacerbated when the battery is not fully charged re regularly. And it's what happens when you just sit, you leave your car in your driveway for a month and you never charge it. Uh, the lead acids, the lead sulfate crystals build up. They, they uh, become so thick and static in their form that um, they cannot be redissolved easily back into the battery chemistry. So you start to lose battery capacity over time. So the solutions to that is we can provide an equalizing charge, as we've talked about, to try and kickstart the chemistry again. Um, it also reduces the acid stratification, so as the, uh, you know, the different layers form because some parts of the chemistry is heavier than the other. So that helps mix everything back up again. Another solution which is new in the market is to try and operate the battery in partial state of charge. So you will hear the word PSOC floating around. Instead of operating the battery between 100% and 80%, you would then start operating the battery between, say, 90% and 30%, um, and then doing a charge once in a while to re-equalize everything. Now, we traditional lead-acid batteries don't like this very much, but we can add carbon to the negative electrode to, to enable this to occur. So this is what we call advanced lead-acid batteries. Um, here we have our lead oxide, our separator, and our lead plate. We could do a lead oxide uh, cathode, a separator, and a carbon electrode. Or we can take the best of both worlds 
and put the, the cathode as a lead oxide, your separator, and a lead plate with carbon on that. Um, so, so there we start to have the qualities of both the battery and the supercapacitor, which we talked about earlier. And one company in Australia has done just that. So this is the Ecolt Ultra Battery. They are actually manufacturing this. Um, it's partnered with a couple, a couple of manufacturers. I, I can't remember the details exactly. But it is essentially carbon on the lead plate and they operated in partial state of charge. So here, instead of charging the battery to 100% and right down to 0%, most of the work of the battery is performed between 90 and 30 percent and that regime gives them long cycle life um, so you can charge the battery a lot if that's what we're talking about with cycle life and and extend the life of the battery from I don't know one year to ten years maybe if we if we're lucky so because it's got the carbon in the electrode we get high charge acceptance and high charge delivery so we can push that power in and out but then we've got the chemistry happening in the background. So behind that initial pump, we've got the standard lead acid battery chemistry working, and so that gives you the long duration. Um, so it has high performance and long in the partial state of charge, and therefore we increase the lifetime of our battery. So I'll give you some examples tomorrow in how Ecolt have used that battery in real life scenarios and how it's performing. So from an academic point of view, a lot of research is going on in the carbon sector at the moment. Um, we take activated carbon, which has a high surface area, but the electrolyte um, ions can only access so much of that carbon. So then the idea is to uh, perhaps use a different carbon. So carbon, single wall carbon nanotubes have been quite the in thing in recent years. But the problem with that is that the electrolyte ions can only access part of the uh, structure again, and they tend to sit on the outside walls. Graphene. Graphene, our wonder material, which hasn't quite solved the world's problems yet, but maybe it will. Again, that comes in sheets. But because the, the spacing between the graphite sheets is, is perhaps too small, we can't get the electrolyte ions to, to penetrate between the sheets, so therefore Again, they're only sitting on certain areas where they can access, and it limits the capacity of the cell. So maybe we do something like put nanotubes between the carbon graphene sheets, and therefore we can have uh, anions and cations sitting on the surface and in between. And because the uh, uh, single wall carbon nanotubes in this example are highly conductive, we also improve the conductivity of our electrode. So that's from an uh, academic kind of research point of view. And this is also coming into the uh, industrial world. This is marketing material from Cabot Corporation. And some of the stuff that I know about is from personal communications with, with someone in Cabot Corporation themselves. So I've just pulled this out. PBX is uh, just the coding. It doesn't necessarily mean anything to me or you, and it doesn't need to. But what they have done is developed a range of carbon materials that can operate across the spectrum and improve your battery performance. So the PBX51 that they talk about is a high surface area product, so it's going to give you high charge acceptance. You can pump the power in and out really quickly. So that product is probably going to help using batteries for things like forklifts where you just need to be able to, the battery needs to be able to power an instantaneous lift and an instantaneous drop. Did, did you have a question? No? Okay. Um, on the other side of the scale, we've got PBX55, and that has a low surface area. You'd, you would probably use those in... Um, your traditional type of lead acid batteries where they just need to go and go and go and sit in a, in a, uh, in a power station, support station, um, for a long time, but they need long cycle life. So they've optimised the carbon for that. And then in the middle, they have another series in here and they have good power and good cycle life. And 
In this scenario, you may be looking at batteries that are used in home energy storage systems where you want them to last a long time because you've installed it in your house, so maybe 10 years, but you also want it to be optimized for power in terms of we want to access our video games or our microwave or whatever it is instantaneously and have that response time from the battery. So these are all the... the uh, the development of carbons is really important in the lead-acid battery, battery uh, field at the moment because lead-acid batteries are really trying to find a way to compete with lithium and stay in the market. I might skip this one because we're, we're slightly running out of time, but uh, it essentially says the same thing. So where do we go from lead-acid batteries? Well, over time, if we go back to 1859, it seems quite a long time ago. Um, at the same, relatively same time, we had our first power um, hydro station plants coming on. And then there's a huge gap. There may be other technologies coming up in here, but then we had compressed air, flywheel systems, and this has driven the need for, for um, the ability to, to increase fossil fuel, you know, fossil fuel prices, getting penetration of renewable energy into the grid, that sort of thing. And so along that line, we have the development of batteries. So it's 1970s, the lithium-ion battery is developed. We have a uh, sodium sulfur battery in the 1980s and a lead, uh, the redox flow batteries in the mid-1980s uh, as well. And it's not until the late you know, 2000, 2010 that we start to see projects that actually where you have big batteries, scale batteries, um, mitigating power, power sites and, uh, and commercial operations to actually regulate energy flow and all that sort of stuff. So we, we, we commonly just assume that the, the lithium-ion battery has always been around, but actually it's taken a few years to get here and now it's just part of our everyday life. So... So it's interesting to see where the batteries have come and how long they've taken to develop. So lithium-ion batteries, we all know about them because they're in so many applications in our everyday life. Apple, Tesla, power tools, fighter jets, trains nowadays, and even buses for electric vehicles. It's always good to talk about the... Uh, Gigafactory that's coming online to support the Tesla, things like the Tesla uh, car and the uh, power walls, the home energy storage systems. And this is, I find this absolutely amazing because by 2018, which is only next year, the Gigafactory will reach full capacity and produce more lithium ion batteries than five years ago in 2013. So the scale of battery production is increasing dramatically. And Elon Musk is quoted as saying we actually did the calculations to figure out what it would take to transform the whole world to sustainable energy and you'd need 100 gigafactories. I have no idea what's behind those calculations, but we'll take his word for it for now. And of course he was in the news last week because he has announced that he can provide a 100 megawatt battery before the summer. So before December 2017, and if he doesn't do it, he'll give you your money back, which is uh, a huge risk or a huge marketing strategy. Um, this all came about because the uh, South Australia experienced a number of blackouts, I think, last September. And then in March, uh, Elon, it drew the attention of Elon Musk, and there was a Twitter exchange between a couple of wealthy individuals, and he said, I bet you I can do it, and I'll do it in 100 days. And this is what we've ended up as. So there's a, there's a bid for the government. I think there were about 91 uh, partners bidding for the opportunity to put batteries into a uh, wind farm to help um, provide energy stability for South Australia. Let's see if he can do it. If he doesn't do it, I think he's going to lose about 50 million, give or take. But does he save 50 million in marketing strategies if he gets it right? So I don't think it's all, it's all what it's, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of play in the market because this is something that's new and exciting 
and it's how he's getting his technology out there. However, it is a 100 megawatt system and the largest so far from using this technology is in California and it's 30 megawatts. So it is a big ask and I think it will be interesting to watch the space and apparently you can go as a tourist and visit once it's all up and running. So if you get the opportunity, go and have a look. Now, this hasn't actually come out very well, but basically what I want to say is Elon Musk gets all the attention, but let's have a look at what's coming out of China. Here's the US with planned announced constructions and things that are under constructions, and this is generally what's happening around the Elon Musk gigafactory. But look at China, already under construction, huge number of plants announced, and the scale is just phenomenal. So what this means is that we're going to have even more batteries coming on in the market. I think we need to be wary as consumers because we need to make sure the quality is good because we can either make or break this space. If we scare consumers because the quality of the batteries, particularly lithium, aren't good enough and things are catching on fire, then we, then we shut down the market. But it's not just the US, it's not just Elon Musk, it's China so, as well. So let's just have a quick look at lithium-ion batteries and how they work. Basically, you've got your anode and your cathode again, but rather than having an electrochemical reaction, you are shunting lithium ions in and out of the anode or the cathode, depending on, your, on whether you're discharging or charging. And you have a separator in between to, uh, to regulate the exchange of ions between these, these two materials. So let's look at the anode first, because that's a simple one. That's typically comprised of a graphite electrode. Um, the graphite itself has layers uh, in an ABA fashion, and the uh, lithium ions will insert in those layers like such. And if you look down on a plan view example, that's how the material would look when the lithium um, ions insert into the graphite electrode. Now the reason why we have different type of lithium ion batteries is because we have different types of cathode materials. So your most common one is the lithium cobalt oxide and it's, it's what's developed traditionally. Um, it has superior energy, it has great power density compared with other cathode materials but the reason why we don't always push it is because it's expensive. Now lithium itself is expensive but the components that make up this anode, uh, cathode is, uh, is cobalt. Cobalt is, um, I think it's, it mostly comes out of Congo or Africa where the supply is, is, uh, is trapped. So the resources are limited, it's expensive because of that and it's also toxic. So what do you do to get rid of the cobalt at the end of its life cycle and how do you how do you recycle something that's so toxic? We don't really want to be dealing with it. So other chemistries have come up because of this. A common one is the lithium um, manganese oxide. It's great because it's inexpensive. It doesn't have any uh, nasty, nasty chemicals, nasty ions in there. So it's environmentally benign. And it has good thermal stability, so it's safe or relatively safe. Um, the lithium iron phosphate is now one of the most common technologies out there. Apologies for the, oh no, they're coming up. So if we just compare the lithium iron, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, it has very good capacity. Um, your lithium manganese oxide, not so great capacity, but it's stable, safe, environmentally friendly. Or we can go to this one, which is a playoff between the amount of potential that it can provide and the amount of capacity that it can provide. It's, uh, you know, it's, not, not, it's better than the uh, lithium manganese oxide in terms of energy, but it doesn't have such great potential. So there's a playoff on how, on, on how well it performs and what you would use it for. So terrible slide, I know, because it's full of writing, but I think it just highlights the things we look at when we're choosing a material and how we tend to develop battery materials. So the lithium iron, uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, battery is now becoming the most common one for medium and high power energy systems. 
It has excellent safety. It's the safest positive cathode material out there at the moment. It's environmentally friendly. It's resistant to overcharge, therefore you're unlikely to get things like thermal one array and fires. Um, it has a reversible capacity, so the chemistry doesn't get stuck if you can't quite put enough charge in to reverse what has happened. Um, it has an intermediate working voltage, so perhaps not so great, but we can work around that. It has good compatibility with most organic electrolytes. I've not really touched on organic electrolytes in this because we don't have, have the time, but what it does mean is that we can store, uh, have longer storage in the battery. So long, longer cycling life, which is up to at least 3,000 cycles at 100% of discharge. So we're accessing more power, more energy than what we would for a lead acid battery. So if we're talking 3,000 full cycles and you do one cycle a day, you're looking at a battery that's going to last 10 years. And again, it has rapid charge performance, so we can charge the battery within 30 minutes. Um, it has slight volume shrinkage, so as you put the, uh, if you take the lithium ion out, the, the uh, material contracts, but when you, it's, it's complementary with the lithium inserting into the, the cathode, the anode material for the, car, uh, the negative, carbon negative anode, and that's, so because it's the, there's a synergy there, it actually works really well together. However, lithium has its drawbacks, and of course the main one that we all know about is that it catches on fire. And it's a huge concern because now we're being prevented from taking laptops on planes, we're not sure about our Samsung phones. Um, here is an example of a lithium ion uh, battery catching on fire inside of a bus in China. So there is really warranted concerns about the safety of the battery. So just to... Uh, introduce you to a slightly different type of battery. We're going to look briefly at flow batteries. Um, the flow battery is first developed in eight, uh, 1986. It comes out of New South Wales uh, University, and so it's an Australian technology that has been developed. What we have is two separate tanks of electrolyte, and these can be different formulations. And when you charge and discharge the battery, these electrolytes interact and the ion exchange occurs in a tank between the ion exchange membrane. So because it's such a massive system where you're pumping electrolyte around, we need a cooling system because it tends to, to release a lot of heat. We also need extra accessories like a pump to, to move the, the electrolyte around. So we generally operate this battery between 20 and 40 degrees, which is okay for typical operation. Um, but the battery efficiencies aren't that great, perhaps between 65 to 80 percent. It has 10 to 20 cycles, 20,000 cycles, so it can last a long time. It also has short response times, so you can get your power out rather quickly, but it is bulky and massive. So... Uh, there's two types of chemistry that are on the market at the moment. The first one is your vanadium redox chemistry, and here we are uh, accessing the, the, uh, the four different oxidation states of vanadium. So if we uh, discharge the cell, we would change vanadium 5 plus to vanadium 4 plus, and that comes in the vanadium v, VO2 plus species, goes to a VO2 plus. Oh. You, you can read it, I'm getting tongue-tied, species. And then on the other side, we have vena uh, vanadium 2 plus ac accessing the vanadium 3 plus oxidation state, and here's the equation for that. So we have literally got vanadium oxide species in a tank, and they are changing the oxidation state by putting electrons in or electrons out. Uh, so, and another chemistry that is uh, also common is a zinc bromine flow cell. Again, it's got the tanks, the same principle, but we have different chemistry. So on the bromine side, bromine is actually very nasty, so it needs to be contained. Bromine, uh, the bromide is, forms bromine in an aqueous phase, and zinc, for, uh, zinc 2 plus goes to zinc, a zinc solid um, that forms on 
on the electrode. And the electrodes are probably made out of a carbon type of material. Again, we've got to deal with two different uh, types of elect uh, electrolyte chemistry on the zinc side and, a two and again on the bromine side, and we've got to get pumps to make this all happen. So another Australian company that's using this technology is Redflow. And the one on the left is what you can buy to put in your home. So this is your home energy storage system. It's 10 kilowatt hours. And well, you can go, go to a much larger system. Well, it's the same sort of system, size system. But this one has a little bit more spec to it. So it's warranted for 30 megawatt hours or 10 years, whatever comes first. But it's interesting to see this picture because you can see the two different tanks of solution and interacting within the, the uh, reservoir here. Now I wanted to show you this because as, I, uh, as we can see from here, if we go back to computer technology, where were we in the 1980s? In the 1980s, IBM had a 2 point gigabyte, gigabyte hard drive which looked huge, it weighed 250 kilos and $100,000. Is this comparable to what we're looking at now? It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting comparison because I think it illustrates that anything is possible and we have a long way to go. And some of the chemistries that we're talking about are very mature, so it's hard to imagine downsizing or scaling something to a, to a hard drive that we now operate on from a battery this size. But I think you have to realize that there is opportunities to take batteries into this space. And that's what we're trying to do with Gelion. So this is the new startup company that I'm working with. And uh, yeah, I've just got five minutes. Um, so what we're trying to do is take an old chemistry, the zinc bromine chemistry, and make it better, make it low cost, make it safer, all that sort of stuff. And we want to do it in a time frame that's that's now. We, we've already seen we need more batteries. Batteries, batteries, batteries. We need more batteries. And investors are trying to throw money at, at battery companies at the moment. And I think while you see lead acid batteries, you see redox batteries, you see lithium ion batteries, I think there's an opportunity. And there's a whole lot of companies and startups flying under the radar. And I think you need to watch the space because there is opportunities here to downsize, to make batteries more powerful and it all comes down to taking chemistry that we know and changing it up a bit. So I'd like to show you a video which summarizes how, how we're going to do this and where we're going. Um, obviously I can't talk in detail about it but I think this will give you an excellent idea of where we could go in the future and if you wanted to do batteries as a research opportunity, what you might be looking at. So um, everyone in this video is part of my team. They're not actors. They are young, they're doing their PhDs, or they've just graduated as, as engineers, or they've had 10, 20 years experience in the lab. Uh, and it's not necessarily on batteries, it's on chemistry that relates to batteries. So they're applying their skills as a chemist or an engineer and now using it in the battery field. So it's not something from your perspective that you could be very far away from. So I think it's really important to realize that you can be part of solutions to the energy, the energy storage problem in the very near future. I believe that if we find ways of generating and storing power from renewable resources, um, we will make the problem with oil and coal and other carbon problems disappear right. because economically we will wish to use these other methods. Right. And if we do that, right. a huge step will have been taken yeah. towards solving the problems of the earth. In our renewable energy future, batteries will be needed everywhere. They will be everywhere. 
absolutely everywhere. They'll be in cars, they'll be in houses, they'll be in office blocks, they'll be in factories, they'll just be everywhere. They will be ubiquitous. But all the lithium batteries in the world today could only store 46 seconds of our daily power needs. We need to move to renewables, but we need a revolution in batteries to do it. Lithium ion batteries were of course a massive leap in the early 90s, but it increasingly shows limitations. Lithium ion battery production faces serious problems of supply, safety and critically of cost. Lithium ion batteries are expensive to scale. It is just not economical to produce the amount of batteries we need to store the power we use. Scalable green power requires a breakthrough in batteries and Jalion may be it. Our breakthrough uses inexpensive components that are readily available. We can solve the issue of scalability. That's what we've done with Jalion. Faced with the limitations of lithium-ion technology, Professor Mashmeyer's team revisited an older battery chemistry called zinc bromine. By rethinking zinc bromine, Jalion has created powerful batteries with more common and thus low cost materials. Zinc is nine times cheaper per electron transferred than lithium. So the Jalion technology is a huge leap in terms of price. Lithium ion can also overheat, which makes them dangerous. Our gel is resistant to a blowtorch of a thousand degrees. It does not catch fire. We are very comfortable on this point. The supply of zinc and bromine is uh, well distributed around the world. Therefore, the cost is going to be stable and the supply is going to be secure. Very different to the case for lithium and cobalt. Traditionally, zinc bromine has been used only in flow batteries, large complex machines too expensive and impractical for true mass production. We, on re-evaluating the zinc bromine chemistry, came to the conclusion, hey, we can tweak this, we can make this better, we can make this more elegant, we can make it non-flow, we can make it look like a conventional battery. Gel Ion's first breakthrough is a new zinc bromine liquid battery, re-engineered to be non-flow, simpler and scalable. And Gel Ion's next generation uses revolutionary gel chemistry. One of the really cool things about the gel approach is that I can go from a capacitive type performance, so very fast power discharge, to a very slow and steady discharge with the same gel. All I have to do is vary the thickness of the gel. That's unique. Geline is not just a new kind of battery, but a platform that can be adjusted for different purposes. This versatile platform technology, adaptable to more than one battery chemistry, enables Jalion to target diverse markets, including local storage in homes and offices, micro devices, and utility storage. In construction, in buildings, we are working together with a number of multinational construction companies. These companies want to act as test sites for our batteries to see how well they can incorporate them into their buildings, into the actual fabric of the building, so the wall will become a battery. As renewable energy continues to grow, the battery storage market will grow exponentially. The market is already 80 billion, and people easily talk about markets of size of trillions of dollars. Jalion is in the enviable proposition that we've hit our milestones 14 months early. So we now need to accelerate our program to capitalize on that breakthrough. We will have a fully mass manufacturable product towards the end of 2018, early 2019. Safe, abundant and low cost, the versatile Jalion platform can solve the problem of scalability to unlock the potential of renewables and power the future. I think the key thing is here is that it, it's really exciting and there's 
let's just sum up to say there's two reasons why I don't sleep at night. One, because I have a very young baby. <laughs> two, because I've got to deliver this battery in 18 months' time. <laughs> so thank you very much, and we'll, uh, we'll talk some more tomorrow. Thank you.